Today's special International Women's Day episode of Socially Democratic is proudly brought to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a progressive campaign agency that specialises in campaigning and community organising. We work with non-profit and community-based organisations, trade unions, progressive businesses and social democratic parties across the globe. Dunn Street develops community engagement and organising strategies to win campaigns both big and small. Dunn Street trains engagement staff, volunteers and organisers in leadership and power building. Uh, we help leaders craft their own public narrative that tells a story to unite people and move them to act together. And if you want to partner with Dunn Street in 2023, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also proudly brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Are you passionate about extending access to justice? Morris Blackburn has an exciting opportunity for a union participation manager to join the firm on a 12-month contract based in the Melbourne CBD office. This is a high-profile opportunity where you can bring your passion and enthusiasm to the role that will see you drive and promote the Morris Blackburn ethos. To help reach more clients in need, to find out more about this role, visit morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. And finally, today's episode is brought to you by SwiftFox. Every moment on a campaign matters. You need the tools that you can trust. Lists that are up to date, phone banks that can change minds, emails that drive donations and events that will energise the community online and offline and text blasts that distills your message perfectly. Swift Fox CRM is made for campaigners by campaigners. And to find out more, go to swiftfoxcrm.com to win your next campaign. Hello and welcome to our, as I said at the top, our special, our annual International Women's Day mic handover episode. If you're new to Socially Democratic, um, what we do is uh, every International Women's Day for the last three years, we've handed the microphone over to uh, Liberty Sanger, who's one of the, uh, um, the head of their uh, national uh, injuries department at Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Uh, we handed over to Julia Fox, who is the National Assistant Secretary of the SDA, the Retail Union. And we handed over to Natalie Hutchins, who is the uh, Minister for Education and the Minister for Women in the Victorian State Labor Government. And those three women leaders will discuss uh, all of the issues that are confronting women in the space of gender equity, uh, the law, in workplaces uh, and in government and in politics, uh, and all the intersectionality between all of those three areas and they'll bring their expertise to this conversation. But this conversation has been going for three years. So what normally happens is uh, Liberty, Nat and Julia go back and revisit what they talked about 12 months ago uh, and see what's changed in those 12 months, what progress has been made and what challenges continue to front in this particular space. It's a really riveting conversation. It's a bit like remember that TV show 7-Up where they'd go back and visit a group of individuals seven years on. Well, we're doing this kind of every 365 days. Um, it's a, and I think it's a really, really valuable conversation, hence why we hand it over to these people to, to lead this conversation themselves. Don't need me to be involved in that when you've got better people than I to, uh, to discuss. So I really enjoy this uh, episode and I hope you do uh, too. Uh, don't forget to um, follow the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, and be sure to give us five stars on Apple Podcasts when you're done listening to the show or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And for all the latest updates, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. Okay, let's get to today's special episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our special International Women's Day podcast. Uh, I'm Liberty Sanger, and uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we meet on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'm very delighted to be joined once again for this special podcast by my dear friends, Natalie Hutchins and Julia Fox. Hello to both of you. Hello. How are you? And oh, I'm really well. Uh, angry, as usual, as I prepare for this podcast, but otherwise well. Um, and Natalie, before we start, I'd like to congratulate you on your recent promotions. Uh, you are now the Minister for Women in addition to the Minister for Education. So it's a real treat to have the Minister for Women here today on this podcast. Thanks, Liv. Appreciate it. Congratulations. All right, well, let's kick off. A lot has happened since we last met. Uh, we've had three elections. We've had the South Australian and Victorian state elections and one reasonably significant federal election 
Yeah. Uh, we've had uh, Jacinda Ardern uh, sadly depart the stage um, and encounter a few ridiculous questions along the way. Uh, we've all lived through the uh, heartache uh, of Brittany Higgins as that has continued to unfold. And we are a decade on from the misogyny speech. And, and that's just a short list I put together. Um, so where should we start? I thought we should start with the elections because we've got two extraordinary political analysis analysts here with us today. Um, so why don't we just dive straight in? Uh, let's start with the federal election. What happened there? Uh, what are your views on how women voted and how women were responding to uh, the issues that Scott Morrison was putting on the agenda? Uh, Nat, perhaps we'll start with you. Uh, I think look, people were kind of, uh, particularly women, were sick of um, being treated as second-class citizens and I think they, they took their actions to the ballot box um, in probably the kind of quietest way uh, that I've seen in a long time. Like there wasn't, you know, rallies in the streets uh, in the lead-up to the election but there certainly was uh, a rebellion at the ballot box and I'd say uh, Labor and, and the Teals and the Greens positioned themselves very well by having so many fantastic women candidates which uh, were, um, you know, the benef beneficiaries of that backlash against the federal government. Mm. Uh, and Julia, when we last met, you were urging uh, listeners to use their vote to send their protest and put the Liberals last, particularly women. Uh, you made the point, actually, that uh, you know, the former federal government sh had shown through their policy action that they were disrespecting women. Um, you must have been some kind of prophet. You were certainly well listened to. Uh, what are your reflections on how women voted at the last election? Uh, I think it was... Um it was interesting how many conversations people were having about uh, gender in, in a different way, I think, in terms of representation and to um, Nat's point about the teals and just, you know, there was some um, a lot of female candidates and, um, and good quality candidates. So I think the arguments around representation for the Liberal Party was just really clear that they weren't even looking for proper candidates to um, actually uh, be a representative party and... Um, that was really interesting. So I think people were just sick of the lip service that was paid to women and the issues that women feel strongly about, whether it's workplace issues or sexual harassment or um, things like family and domestic violence leave and all those things that were um, important for women just weren't uh, part of the Liberal narrative at all. And I think he was, um, Scott Morrison was a real disadvantage, I think, with some of the um, ways that he had represented and been, um, or in his leadership, I think, particularly around issues um, of gender equality. So it was interesting. But I think since the election, it's been a collective sigh of relief, you know. You hear it. It's audible. Um, people are just like, oh, thank God there's change, you know. We needed that because it just felt like we were really on the edge. If it had gone the other way, um, I think a lot of women felt that we would be going backwards very quickly, more so than we had been. So I think it was a real turning point for women. Mm, it feels like it's been a seismic shift. Mm. Um, I, uh, I recall Paul Erickson talking about one of the things that kept showing up in polling was that women uh, were appalled at um, Scott Morrison's comments that he only realised about how angry we all were on the issues of sexual harassment and, and, and the particular allegations that Brittany Higgins was raising when he reflected on them as a father and a husband. And I remember when I first heard that, I thought, I can't actually believe that the Prime Minister of Australia has just said that. That's so absurd. Um, how has he not reflected on this as the Prime Minister of Australia? So, you know, I well understand why that continued to show up. And then the other thing that continued to show up was that comment he made when uh, there were the protests outside Parliament. And, uh, and he made the comment that, you know, how lucky all these women were to be able to protest so safely in this country because in other countries they'd be met with bullets. Like it's a complete um, disconnect. But it's interesting for me to reflect on the fact that those comments kept being played in the focus groups and the research that the ALP were undertaking because um, they're obviously representative of something much deeper, but those were kind of the things that stayed with women voters. Oh, it's it was just a disrespect for, you know, what 
what is important to so many women's lives and that's, you know, safety in the community, safety in the workplace, um, mm. not being recognised as something that was, you know, hitting a nerve um, by the Prime Minister. And I, you know, I think I said on this podcast last year, I hope to not ever see Scott Morrison uh, washing um, <laughs> a woman's hair as a, as a media stunt ever again because I just found the whole thing a little bit creepy. Um, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to see that ever again now, um, <laughs> which is a good thing. And it's so fantastic to have a new federal government in place that understands what's important to women. And I think that's coming through um, in leaps and bounds with the legislation that they're pri- prioritising through the parliament. Oh, yeah, totally agree. And, and just before we go there, um, what are your thoughts on how the Liberal and National Party have ended up here as compared to the Labor Party? I mean, I think that the, the um, Federal Parliamentary Labor Caucus is over 50% women, uh, whereas the um, LNP caucus is uh, is well under 30. Um, and then we see now um, statistics on how well we're doing as a nation on women in the parliament. I think um, 38% overall of our parliamentarians are women, 31% of the lower house representatives are women, 53% of the Senate are women. But that change has been driven by the Labor Party. It hasn't been driven by the Liberal National Party. Um, So what's led to that? And although we're not in the business of giving them advice, you know, what would they have to do to change that? I don't think they're a voice, I mean, for you know, half of the population. And I think that's come through really clearly. Um, lack of leadership. Um, still still hearing them um, fight over in their party about quotas and making sure women are equally represented in the party. I think the um, Liberal assessment of what went wrong kind of missed the main game, which was gender, was a huge part of what went wrong. And mm. they just don't seem to be able to self-reflect um, and listen to uh, those voices, and even with the impact of the Teals, who normally would have probably fallen very much into the Liberal Party um, in a, in the previous days, you just think, well, how come they haven't seen that either? Um, it's been just a lack of self-reflection is, is really stark, and if they can't reflect on that, then they just can't lead or govern, can they? Because they just don't see what's the issues that are important to people. Mm, they amazing. have a lack of diversity of uh, thought around yeah. the cabinet table, shadow cabinet table and within their caucus. Yeah, um, and, and we've no. seen a, a couple of times over the last couple of years um, Liberal leaders come out and say, oh, yes, with this vacancy that's come up, it's definitely going to be a woman. Um, and we even saw in New South Wales um, the current Premier say that this round of pre-selections uh, for the Liberal Party up there were going to be skewed um, towards getting more women into Parliament and he he didn't have a lot of success with that and they're still um, not committing to quotas and that's that's the, the best thing. Affirmative action is what delivers the real change. Mm. And I think uh, I may have said on last year's podcast, so my observations um, of where uh, the private sector is at and corporate Australia is at, is they absolutely get that you need to have targets inside, uh, transparent targets reported against. Uh, you need leadership that's committed to uh, making the change and you need your organisation on board with the change. Uh, and, you know, it extends well beyond only gender. It's around diversity and inclusion, you know, and um, you know, I'm so thrilled that we have Muslim representatives at the table. We have... Asian representatives at the table, Um, you know, we've got the whole mix of Australia at the table uh, in the, in the Labor caucus. But, you know, when you look at the Liberal caucus, they're not only behind when it comes to gender, but they're behind on all the other diversity attributes as well, which just makes you wonder how they're going to connect to uh, modern Australia um, and, you know, multicultural Australia uh, you know, 50-50 women and men Australia, how are they going to connect and come up with policies that are relevant uh, and speak to what the needs of ordinary everyday Australians are? I think in their heart they don't see that those um, things you've just gone to, their liberty, are structural in nature. So they mm. just don't, they're not prepared to um, change the structures to support that. They kind of think it will just happen by osmosis. They just don't yeah. get that gender inequality is structural. 
right? It, it's because of yeah. the structures and systems we have in place. Um, they still view it kind of in this individual. Well, I don't. I'm not discriminating. I've got equal access to everything. They and I just think that just comes through so strongly in their resistance to any sort of change because it goes to the heart of recognizing that there are structural um, inequalities that need to be addressed. And to address them, you have to actively address them. Um, yeah. So it's a really strange. And I don't think they clearly haven't made the mind shift towards that yet. They've got a long way to go. And to be honest, how long do they have? to catch up to the rest of the community, um, probably not that long. And I just don't think they seem like they want to jump in and <laughs> address it. They That's such a, such a great it. question. Oh, yeah. Nat, over to you. Oh, just ultimately, I think um, the federal Liberal Party in particular has paid the price for not dealing with this. And that's the seats that they lost at, at the election. And and the move here in Victoria towards Teals was um, pretty extraordinary. And all women um you know in those seats well what do you both think about that um whether teals are once-off phenomenon or are we likely to see those teal members of parliament uh, stand again and win again and if they do what does that mean for the liberal national party well i think if they got smart and pre-selected some women in those seats that had community connections and ties um then they might they might be able to claw them back, but in the meantime, uh, there's a lot of uh, women in those roles that are getting out there and and being heard and and seen. And I think people will make the judgment based on what those um, MPs deliver in their local areas, which you know puts them in a pretty good. You know, it's always easier when you're the incumbent to get re-elected. Mm. Mm, totally. To, they've got to one pre-select women, but have a policy agenda on women. Yeah. yeah so there's that's... there's two two sides to that. Is what would they say when they put the candidate up? Mm. It might be a woman. What are they um, offering to the community uh, from a policy perspective? Because I think that was really clear too. They they weren't um, uh, strong on policy in this no. area. So. Well, yeah, I mean, we only have to look at the response to Brittany Higgins and the workplace sexual harassment issues, uh, as well as the lack of action on the gender pay gap um, it, in order to see that. Um, uh, and Nat, you will have now done some work on the National Family Violence Strategy as well. So I think that had been allowed to uh, dwindle under the last federal government also. Um, we have seen, uh, we have seen in the Aston by-election the uh, Liberal Party, in fact, Peter Dutton, insist on a woman being pre-selected and we've seen Rashina Campbell pre-selected for the Liberal Party. Uh, she's going head-to-head -head with our previously pre-selected and once again running candidate Mary Doyle. What do you both think about the Aston by-election? Um, what do you think? Are there going to be the relevant issues that emerge there and to what extent are they going to uh, feed into the issues of gender? Well, I, I think um, from a Labor perspective, we're in a pretty good position to be getting out the um, the messaging in, in attracting women voters in particular, getting out the message that we have the legislation in the federal parliament that's going to uh, work towards uh, addressing issues of sexual harassment in the workplace and gender equality. Um, there's a gender equality strategy nationally that's being um, worked on by the federal government as we speak. And I think that they're massive uh, enhancements in Labor's favour to speaking to particularly working women um, and working women with families uh, who want to see a real difference. And, um, you know, as Julia just said, I'm not sure what in, in the domain of um, women voters that they're particularly reaching out uh, hard on from the Liberal Party into the seat of Aston. And um, I know our candidate, Mary, is um, a, a strong voice um, for local community out there. And I think she's going to be giving them a real serious run for their money in this uh, by-election. Mm. Well, it's pretty tight at the last election. What do you think, Julia? Uh, I think the other um, interesting factor is, you know, since the federal um, Labor government came into power, so many positive changes have then um, been made in a really short space of time. So there's a real visibility to the community in that seat about actually what can be achieved. And uh, 
sound policy decisions and the implementation of policy and outcomes for women that might actually impact um, and make uh, for better futures. So I think that will be um, interesting as to how much they focus on gender in this community and discussion. Obviously, cost of living is a huge issue, but um, for women, the cost of living pressures, again, um, seem to be compounded when you add in all the structural inequalities that women mm. face, whether it's in their wages or in their retirement outcomes, etc. So I just think there's a, a proof point to be able to demonstrate the, the real difference between the two. And again, reflecting on um, what policy initiatives are targeted at women, I don't know that they have any that they would talk about that haven't already just been delivered by a Labor government. I'm not sure what their plan is for women. Mm. Um, so I think that's going to be a bit of a void, but I do think probably the big focus will be cost of living and those pressures that people are facing in the community. And that will um, inevitably lead to a discussion about the gender pay gap and the particular pressures that um, that women face as a result of the gender pay gap. I, I saw one survey result recently which showed that more women than men are experiencing financial stress and, and uh, um, are talking about financial stress as cost of living increases. So um, it is, you know, th these issues are absolutely experienced um, by reference to your gender and if they're not speaking to those particular issues and the drivers of them, then they're not speaking to the voters. It will be very interesting. I am reliably informed that the government hasn't won a seat from the opposition in a by-election since 1920. So Mary's got a, a big job ahead of her uh, and we haven't held the seat since um, 1990, uh, yeah, 1990. So it's, it's not a small task, but um, there was a big swing against uh, the Liberal Party in the last election, I think 11%. So uh, it will be very interesting to see. Um, the vote interestingly splintered uh, between a number of the minor parties, which I think was something we saw in a lot of places. Um, and it'll be interesting to see which other minor parties also run. Anyway, there's more to come on that, I'm sure. Um, Nat, you and I have spoken a bit about uh, the experiences women have when they run for election. In last year's podcast, you were um, really angry about the experiences that candidates, women candidates were having in uh, the local government elections. Uh, I'm interested in your views. Uh, you've you, we've obviously um, campaigned in a federal election and you've been a candidate in uh, the last state election. What are your views on how women are being treated as candidates? We've had a huge change, unfortunately, for, for the worse at the last state election in having a lot of our female candidates uh, really targeted um, by some quite uh, extreme right-wing parties that were quite active um, and were really um, at times um, getting threatening and um, and physical at uh, the pre-poll and uh, as a result we've had uh, numerous meetings now of our um, female uh, members of parliament to unpick how we can make our, our ballot boxes and our process safer for women because I'm really concerned um, that women into the future uh, may not want to put themselves in that position because, um, quite frankly, at, at times it was scary and um, for some uh, women candidates it was not a safe place. And mm. even for some women voters, we uh, had uh, particularly elderly women who would just walk away rather than... Um, try and get through the very busy line of lineup of uh, numerous candidates thrusting stuff in their face and, and pushing them about. And that was, you know, it's not the typical Australia that we're used to when it comes to um, voting. And it's almost like there was a, a, an air of Trumpism that was influencing mm. um, the voting process about, you know, what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And there was a lot of really unacceptable and unrespectful behaviours that were going on that um, whether it was just women candidates that have spoken up more about it or whether women were were more targeted, um, I'm not sure. But it's certainly, uh, uh, you know, that's my fourth election I've stood in and I've never experienced anything like that before. What about social media? How, how are you experiencing it via social media? Um, yeah, lots of um, 
lots of unfortunate comments on photos about appearance would be the number one um, kind of point of, uh, I guess, abuse. Um, so more on social media about how you look uh, as a female candidate rather than your policies, but more, I would say, about um, uh, policies and intimidation in a face-to-face -face, um, sense. I, uh, I I was listening to one of Julia Gillard's podcasts recently and she had a, a, an expert on who uh, was talking about um, women in politics and particularly the escalation of violence and made the point that this uh, this kind of behaviour is absolutely designed to silence women. It's designed to um, put women off running for office and to withdraw from political discourse and, and trying to affect change. Um, you know, uh, and, as she said that, I just, you know, it really did strike me that that's, you know, whether it's intended or not, that's actually the impact that these kind of comments and behaviours have. Um, how have you and your colleagues um, responded to this? I mean, how do you make sure that, uh, you know, you, you're each kind of supporting yourself and, and also making sure the next generation of women want to run for parliament? Yeah, I think, um, well, we were checking in with each other during the election and really um, having to double down on making sure that no female candidates were left alone um, in a public situation, um, which was always hard when you've got um, volunteers that you're relying on to make sure that mm. that, that um, and even not having female volunteers on their own as well was an issue. But um, we came together as a women's caucus, uh, the Labor Women's Caucus last week, just to talk about a submission and, and some ideas going forward around how we can make the process safer into the future. Um, but Liberty, I've got to say, um, having had the portfolio of women four years ago and coming back into it again, uh, nothing can be, the, having the portfolio of women. Um, it, it just is a magnet for a negative uh, attraction from a whole range mm. of quarters, but predominantly men um, and men's rights activists. Just targeting every single um, comment that I make on social media, no matter how positive you try and make it, there's always a, a negative comment that has to be hidden because quite often it's really offensive. Um, and I didn't, you know, I had a, a, a break from uh, the women's portfolio, went into corrections and youth justice and they're pretty tough portfolios and mm. I never had the negative, the volume of negative feedback that I've had in the women's portfolio um, from men's rights activists and, and other groups out there who tend to target uh, women politicians. And it's not just a Victorian thing, it's an Australian. This happens, you know, all around our nation, and unfortunately, around the world. Mm. I think it's Julia, still yeah. got to be, um, you know, the, the, that far right uh, tactics um, also, though, for me, is so instrumental in the role the media has in that. Um, and, you know, the behaviour and the media reporting for the Victorian state election was just mind boggling um, in so many ways. But the, role, the media has a role to play. And I think, um, you know, <laughs> They're, they're feeding fires and, and kind of allowing this to be acceptable. Um, and I think that's part of the problem with the, the far right, but it definitely is impacting women. I know women who might have wanted to put their hand up are saying, oh, I'm not going to put myself, my mm. family, my kids through that level that of real, abuse. That, that worries me so yeah. much. Yeah, um, so it's working, isn't it? But it's, that's um, right. It's, it's working. Appalling. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is not something that uh, – that, men experience in a gendered way they you know um i think it's accepted that there's a bit of rough and tumble in politics and you know there's a contest of ideas and that when you're putting something out there you know it's up for debate but that's within certain parameters and then there are other comments sexualized comments violent comments um uh, you know comments about appearance and the like which are absolutely designed to intimidate humiliate or frighten, scare, um, detract women from participating in the political process at all. Yeah. And even on polling booths, um, to Nat's point, like it was felt heightened, like aggressive and heightened, um, which is normally it's kind of, you know, it's, it's good fun in, when you're on the booths and everyone mm. interacts in different ways. But like, you know, the booth I was on, it was really 
it was it was quite tense and just uh, a different experience for that candidate. The candidate in the seat that I was in was just explaining what they'd been through and some of the issues they'd had in the street when they're out talking to their community um, and at times felt threatened, had called police a number of times. And you're just thinking, this is crazy. Um, yeah. And, you know, it needs to be addressed, the tactics that are being adopted by um, the far right. Yeah, Julia, I I never had to call the police ever in an election, and this this election just gone. I've I think I may may have had to call the police maybe five times in total, um, because of the level of um, threat and perceived physical threat that was um, kind of being bandied around. But look. I do want to emphasise a positive liberty, and that is we yes. ended up with 51% um, of women in our caucus. So, Woo-hoo! you know, Woo! something something went right in a yeah. moment. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a quick break to talk about Swift Fox. Every moment on a campaign matters. You need the tools that you can trust. Lists that are up to date, absolutely. Phone banks. Uh, that can change minds, emails that drive donations and events that will energise the community online and offline and text blasts that distill your message perfectly. SwiftFox CRM is made for campaigners by campaigners. And to find out more, go to swiftfoxcrm.com to win your next campaign. Okay, let's get back to the show. Uh, yeah, so uh, so victory is, is very sweet in, in that regard. Um, but you know, I, I think on you know to, to draw to draw a thread that I don't think is is um, ridiculous here. You know, we did come off a climate um, where we had a prime minister of Australia that wasn't able to see or chose not to see, or else was quite um, um, Machiavellian in how he approached the issue of gender. And you know, th- that was not a first. Um, in reading Julia Gillard's book about you know, 10 years on from the Sojourney speech, I was, of course, reminded about all those horrible comments that she had to endure um, from the former leader of the opposition, Tony Abbott, and from Alan Jones and the like, and, you know, just shocking comments about uh, our Prime Minister. Um, and, you know, how far have we come when we, we still see our former Prime Minister um, not being able to, to see or at least not being able to articulate on behalf of the nation the issues relating to gender and, and sort of making a stand about why that was wrong. You know, I hope that with our change in uh, in the Prime Minister and the change in federal government and the agenda that they've got around uh, equality and inclusion, that we see that conversation shift um, because, I mean, like both of you, I'm not in the business of alienating uh, people and if there are people who are feeling like they are being left behind by any of the policies that are being put forward, you want to find a way to build that bridge and, and bring them along. This is an educative process. Um, but, you know, when all that's being promoted is division and sort of playing the, the gender card in order to get votes for, you know, only reasons of power and not for making any change, you can see how quickly you are enabling this conversation, which is having this very direct impact on women and women as candidates and our next generation of women candidates. So on that very positive note, why don't we move along to the positive agenda of the Commonwealth Government uh, and have a a talk about what it is that they're trying to do, in fact, have already done in their their short time in office. Uh, Julia, uh, you are absolutely expert in uh, the Fair Work Act and all the changes that have been made to the Fair Work Act. Do you want to run us through um, what it means to have uh, a, a gender equality objective in the Fair Work Act and all the resulting amendments that have come as well. Yeah, it's um, been a really significant change. And I I think, um, you know, there's lots of conversations about multi-employer bargaining and those sorts of things. But ultimately, I think the changes in the Act uh, regarding gender equality were really, really significant. It still irks me a bit that we needed a Fair Work Act to actually call out that gender equality is an objective. It bothers me that we have to do that. But um, it it made a difference, for example, in our union's um, case when we ran, uh, had to defend the cuts to penalty rates for retail workers. You know, we weren't able to rely on the gendered impact that those cuts would have and they clearly had um, a gendered impact. So having a gender equality objective of the Act is really important. 
it's also, I think, important that it improves access to secure work is another change and, and trying to facilitate women's full economic participation. So it, it's actually got a few limbs and I, I think particularly um, understanding that secure work impacts women more than men in secure mm-hmm. work and how we need to actually make those, again, structural changes to the Fair Work um, Act to allow that um, women to have more secure jobs because that's a real that's a real problem. I think when we look at the modern award objective now has uh, gender equality as part of that objective. So if you're looking at the minimums, terms and conditions that um, awards uh, provide you, then if you're going to make a change to an award, you need to consider gender equality. So that that's really important. I think there's big changes to equal remuneration and we have all mm. um, know how challenging that has been for people to um, be successfully winning cases on equal remuneration when we all know that people are not equally remunerated. Yes. So there's been real blocks to the legislation um, and its impact it's had. So cases have been run by unions for a number of years and it's been really, really difficult. So I think we're hoping that those changes have a very positive impact. I think um, to date only one of those cases has succeeded, yeah, hasn't it? And, I know. Uh, yeah. and that was essentially because the government of the day, Julia Gillard's government, came to the table and said, we'll fund it for yeah. early childhood educators. But every other case that um, was presented failed. That's right. And yeah. and things like the male comparator has now been removed. And yeah. so I think there's some there's opportunities there to, to lift the wages, reflecting the kind of undervaluation um, historical undervaluation of women's work that we've seen, in particularly in those care professions. And then, so you have those expert panels that have now been um, uh, put into the legislation as well to address some of the specific industries. So I think there's some really good opportunities to understand uh, how these workforces have been impacted by those, again, structural inequalities. And so there's an opportunity to address them. So I think that's really important. Um, And then the other one is the respect at work changes. So they're huge. Mm. The pay secrecy laws changes are Mm. really significant and sexual harassment in the Fair Work Act as well. But I think the positive duty is is going to be um, very important. Again, for someone who represents retail and fast food workers, the levels of sexual harassment in our industries um, were the fourth worst. Um, And, you know, the retail industry employs, um, you know, 10% of all working Australians. So we know we've um, got a problem in regards to the levels of sexual harassment. And again, we're in an industry that employs um, more women and it's also an industry with young people. So unfortunately for our members, a lot of their first experience of the job is going to be sexually harassed. Um, yeah. So I think the positive duty is just fundamental to um, starting to see um, positive actions from employers to address uh, what the, the kind of causes of um, poor workplace cultures that lead to sexual harassment. That's just to name a few, Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of work that's been done. Yeah. Oh, well, I know that um, action on sexual workplace sexual harassment is something that's dear to all of our hearts, that all three of us have spent a, a long time campaigning for action to be taken and for uh, workplaces, employers, to take um, responsibility for the cultures that they're overseeing. To, In fact, Nat, you called this out last year on the podcast that this is what you wanted to see over the... Um, 12 months it's just been, you wanted to see uh, women feeling safe and supported when they made allegations of workplace sexual harassment and you wanted to see a reduction in the overall level of sexual harassment. Um, I mean, what are your reflections, Nat, on the the work both the federal government's done? I know that, um, I obviously know that your government's done a lot of work on workplace sexual harassment. I was lucky enough to to be involved in one of the pieces. Uh, What are your thoughts on, on where we're at with with workplace sexual harassment? Oh, I think, unfortunately, there's still a long way to go uh, on this matter. Um, but I think the for us, one of the groundbreaking uh, changes is having some baseline reporting on gender equality um, across our public service and, and some of the entities um, that come under the public service and um, also some uh, and local government as well. Um, to give us a bit of a a clearer view on how each organisation is uh, handling the issue of gender equality. And as a result of that, we're getting action plans in place which help to address um, issues of sexual harassment as well as general equality issues 
uh, in places that may not have considered doing this before. And we've got a, you know, a vision of being able to roll this out into the future, into the private sector, because I think there's just a massive overrepresentation of, of management and HR specialists that don't know what to do when someone complains, uh, when someone says, um, I've been sexually harassed or I've been, um, you know, I've had this experience happen to me. And, you know, quite often, unfortunately, a lot of our, particularly our young women workers will just leave the job um, because it was never dealt with properly um, and move on to somewhere else. Well, that doesn't actually do anything to stop the perpetrator uh, in the first place or the perpetrator gets moved to another division of the business um, and doesn't get their behaviours corrected. In in the education system we've been running now um, and we run it at nearly 2,000 schools, respectful relationships programs, which are about, you know, how to respect each other in a school environment um, and in society. And it's, you know, basic 101 that starts at um, the, you know, kindergarten level right through to kind of consent discussions uh, for our older students in high school. Uh, um, we need that in workplaces as well. It's almost like mm, we need mm, mm. Um, respectful relationships. And I hear it directly from teachers who say, you know, we deliver this fantastic model of training in, res in respecting each other in our school system and in our community. But sometimes we don't have that upheld by parents um, when kids go home and that um, changes that kid's behaviour because they're, they're seeing one thing in the in the home and they're seeing another thing at school in terms mm. of setting benchmarks and I think that, you know, we could possibly um, learn from some respectful relationship programs in our workplaces as well about what's acceptable, what's not, what are the consequences, what does reporting look like and what does supporting colleagues look like, you know, that have reported and how do we change those behaviours. So this training is vital. Um, there's still a long way to go, I think, um, but, you know, as a government, us looking at um, – auditing uh, our, our, ourselves as a, an employer, but um, all of our entities, no matter, you know, how good or bad the news is, it's about being able to measure um, better outcomes. If you don't have a baseline to start from on this, um, on this stuff, looking at pay gaps and looking at um, policies and procedures to promote women in, um, within the workplace, then if we don't have a baseline, to, we just don't know what progress we're making. So this is really important work. We now have 294 gender equality action plans uh, mm. that have come out of this reporting, um, which get to be checked in on um, in then over the next two years to see how action is rolling out. And I know that this is something um, Wajia wants to do uh, much more on a national level and there's some legislation being uh, pushed at the federal level around this, but um, uh, getting uh, other governments in other states to conform and then how do we then push into the private sector? And I'm a strong believer that when state governments and federal governments um, lead the way on this stuff, we do see a flow over into um, real change. And look, that's not to say there aren't some really amazing businesses out there that are already doing this. There are. Mm. Mm. Um, and kudos to them and kudos to all the men and women in those workplaces that are making significant change, whether it's, um, you know, tackling the gender pay gap or whether it's um, putting procedures and policies and training in place around sexual harassment. Um, you know, they are superstars, quite frankly, but there's still a lot more workplaces that need um, need to have that light shined on them and need to have some change. Absolutely. And it's, um, you know, you're, you're spot on. It's, you know, the, the drivers of workplace sexual harassment, the drivers of the gender pay gap, obviously, they all come from the same place, which is the, the bias held around gender inequality. Um, and, you know, and we haven't um, traversed the, the terrain of, of violence and family violence and, um, you know, the terrible outcomes that we see from that, the, the number of women that die at the hands of their partners as a result of of family violence but all of these things are the outputs of of gender inequality and yep. you know you can't tackle one without tackling the other 
Um, Julia, I want to bring you in and I'm not sure if you necessarily want to share this, but I'm going to invite you to anyway, because you and I had an interesting conversation about this uh, recently and, um, and you actually challenged my thinking on it. Um, you were talking about how employers are responding to the positive duty, the early, the early signs of how they're responding to the positive duty. Mm. Can I invite you to reflect yes. and share some of that? Yes, it's been, it's been interesting actually. Um, and we're seeing some positive steps being made by employers, but some early kind of indications are a little bit um, interesting. In, and the first one is, um, you know, employers moving to a zero tolerance um, approach, which sort of on the surface sounds good. Um, but I thought that sounded great, by it the does. way. I was like, where's Julia going with this? I know. <laughs> um, but if you start to sort of unpack it, a couple of things, we've already got very low reporting rates of sexual harassment. Mm. Um, if you ask a lot of members who have um, who've been subjected to sexual harassment what they would like to see, they would like it to stop. Um, yep. Do they want the person sacked? No, not really. Um, in a lot of cases, some definitely do, but in, in a lot of cases, they don't necessarily, that's not what they want the action to be. They want it to stop mm. and mm. to have a safe workplace. Mm. So zero tolerance is, is um, interesting in terms of understanding whether that will impact reporting rates because if I know that I put my hand up and say I've been subjected to sexual harassment from um, this person, my manager, and the zero tolerance, Tolerance policy is immediately that manager will be terminated. I think people won't put their hand up and say they've been sexually harassed. Mm, mm. So that's a concern. The other concern, and there's ways to navigate that. I mean, it should be, again, a, a level of um, severity, what education has been put in place, um, all those things that you should be considering. But a blanket zero tolerance, I think, you need to be very careful about. Um, and I think it's also missing the boat in terms of an individual claimant, uh, you know, complainant model, whereas the legislation is actually about collective culture of workplaces, hostile workplaces, Correct. structural um, issues in workplaces. And this feels like a little bit easy to just go, well, we'll sack everyone who commits sexual harassment. If we do that in retail, there won't be many workplace people left. <laughs> because there is very high incidences of sexual harassment in, in, in all workplaces in Australia. So sacking everyone, we've got to work out a way to make sure people understand what's acceptable um, behaviour. That's why, you know, to Nat's point about uh, respect for relationships. But the cultural part of low reporting, we're also seeing, um, again, I'd like HR professionals to join the dots a bit more. Low reporting, 50% of their workplaces in retail workplace you know employees are casual there's a dot there to be joined yeah don't report if you're going to lose your job right or you're going to yeah. lose your hours um i am worried about we're also seeing policies that reflect bystanders and bystanders have an, a mandatory obligation to report um again that's not addressing really what the positive duty is about which is addressing the hostile work environment and so i don't want employers to kind of overreact at one side and miss the structural because there's a really good opportunity to address the structural, but they're going to mm -hmm. have to do some serious heavy lifting. And part of it is about the structures of employment, the way people are engaged to work, um, the historical undervaluation of work, the levels of discrimination that go on in workplaces that all feed into um, a, a workplace that's hostile in terms of sexual harassment. And it's interesting when you look at from a safety perspective, um, they don't have zero tolerance with safety breaches. You know, I think we've, we've just got to be careful we're not leaping into, you know, the primary duty of care is on an employer um, yes. in the workplace. It's not on the individual. But every policy I ever get read from an employer goes straight to, they skip that part about their duty of care and they go to what the employee is required to do. And I just think we've got to make sure we're having those conversations with employers that puts them in thinking about joining all the dots of why their workplace is hostile. It's such a great point. That it goes to the point you made too, that HR uh, people just don't know what to do when someone goes to them with a complaint of workplace sexual harassment. Uh, and there it's are resources now, and thank you for your time, Lib, on the Ministerial Task Force into Workplace Sexual Harassment. And I think the big key outcome of that inquiry is the fact that the government has said that sexual harassment in the workplace is now and OCH health and safety matter mm. and needs to be handled by WorkSafe. And that means there's there's been some funding that has allowed some proactive work to happen 
around this into our workplaces, but also um, reframes that this is a safety issue. Absolutely. And everyone understands how to deal with a safety issue. You know, you've got your OHS committees, you've got a structure, you've got a structural way of dealing with a structural problem. So OHS committees meet, they talk about the risks of the workplace, to your point, Julia, the hostile nature of the workplace. They're able to talk about the specifics, which might be you know, posters, comments, um, behaviours, but then it does allow for a broader conversation around the composition of the workforce, flexible hours, um, rostering and the like. So, you know, all the things that feed into uh, gender inequality. And then you've got a mechanism by which that's reported internally, transparently, and hopefully a mechanism by which these grievances can be raised in a way that doesn't go to uh, immediate uh, termination of the worker, um, the alleged perpetrator, but does, you know, you're using, sorry, subject to what, uh, how bad the allegation was, obviously, um, but that, you, you know, you're using these moments as education opportunities because that's what's going to get us the shift and that's what's going to make it better for all of us. Um, I mean, I certainly, I, I really respond very favourably to what you've said, Julia, about, you know, any instances of um, comments or behaviours that I've experienced professionally have, I've only ever wanted corrected with a, I need you to know why that's wrong. I don't need you to lose your job over it. But, you know, th that's because of the um, the nature of the comments and behaviours that I've um, been subjected to. It's not because, you know, if they had been more serious, it would obviously require more serious consequences. But again, OHS provides that sort of framework. You know, if there's a very serious incident at work as a result of a, 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 a machine or some other process that causes a physical injury, then, you know, WorkSafe is called in, it's a reportable offence and there's a whole series of consequences that, that flow. If it's not of that gravity, then you don't need to escalate it to that level. And so we've got a lot to apply from our OHS knowledge when it comes to workplace sexual harassment. Um, Julia, I did want to talk to you briefly about the Work and Care Senate inquiry. I was um, really thrilled to see that that had taken place and many of the issues that you and I have talked about over the years around how to get the uh, issues around rostering and care responsibilities in particular on the agenda seem to have been addressed with this Work and Care Senate inquiry. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Look, it's been, um, the, the Senate um, started this at the end of last year um, and it really looks at things like the gendered nature of care, um, some of the inadequacies in the childcare system, issues around parental leave and lack of sort of flexibility and in the employment system. And the one call out I did forget um, in the Fair Work Act is a change to Section 65 um, for all the boffins who know what Section 65 is. But um, it is the right, uh, at the moment we have a right in law to ask a question, um, which is the right to uh, flexible work. And that now has been changed to um, a much stronger entitlement that you can appeal and have a much bigger process with your employer. So it's a really much stronger protection than it was. It's a really significant win. But I think some of the work and care um, Senate reporters really, from understanding the report, the evidence that's been brought out is just all the things that uh, we were talking about for our industry and our work and care report. But, you know, um, Nat touched on it before, there's a real data poverty question. They call it data poverty and that is a real challenge. And some of the important um, data sets we used to collect as a country, we don't anymore. And it's about re reinstigating those. Um, I think Wajia needs to have, you know, better data points as well. They're working on that. So there is that. It's in um, looking at uh, accessible and affordable childcare. That's obviously a barrier for many to manage their work and care. It's about things like parental leave, um, 26 weeks, and obviously the federal government's made an announcement to move it up to 20, but it's not good enough. It needs to be 26, needs to be a full wage replacement, et cetera. So mm -hmm. we are still really behind on that one. Um, I think it's also recognising that we need to increase wages across the care economy. So it reflects on some of those sectors where there's been a traditional undervaluation of uh, work that's performed largely by women. And then one of the key ones for us as a union and the work we've been doing is around this concept of decent work and they call it roster justice, which I quite like that term. Mm -hmm. um, but it's making sure that our IR system, our industrial relations system, um, is able to appropriately respond to people's caring responsibilities, right? Because in our industry, 
a lot of people have caring responsibilities and in every industry and people in general in this country have caring responsibilities. It's about how work and care um, uh, can, you know, can be um, together and, and allow you to manage those things at various times in your life, which change, right? You might have kids when they're two are very different to kids when they're 15, very different to caring for an elderly parent or caring for a child with a disability. So, you know, you need to um, have workplace structures and systems that support you in those um, moments throughout life. And I think that work in Care Senate first report, so they've done an interim report, has really demonstrated that, you know, women experience high levels of unpredictable rostering and short shifts and really makes it hard to manage their responsibilities. So they kind of get the double whammy of um, mm. impact of, one, not being able to make enough income to survive, um, constantly having to juggle. So there's very much an emotional and uh, mental health impact. And uh, and then it impacts their actual finances at the end of the day and their retirement outcomes and all those things. So it's about, um, I think their report's due uh, middle of March, their final report. So um, we'll be very keen to see what they recommend next because some of the things they recommended have already uh, come into play, particularly changes mm. to the Fair Work Act on Section 65. I was really, um, I was really moved by the work that you uh, led uh, through the SDA on uh, the impact of rostering on women. Um, I mean, all of your members, but you know, particularly single women or women that might have um, some other vulnerability that meant that they were having trouble accessing the workplace. You know, just the impact that that meant for them and their kids. You know, couldn't use really childcare because of the unpredictable hours, couldn't really engage the kids in after school activities because that was unreliable, had to rely on um, informal care arrangements, you know, grandparents or friends. And then the the flow on effects for the kids um, and how it was impacting on them. And, you know, and then that terrible sort of um, situation of the, you know, the, the mother usually just the, how she was feeling, like not only exhausted and and stressed about money and, and worried about how she was going to provide, but also worried about the impact that all this was having on her child. And none of that's good for any of us. Um, it doesn't need to be like that. But, you know, the, the consequence of not putting care in the right place and recognising that that's one of the things we need to take account of uh, when we are working out how we employ somebody, um, it, you know, it just it brought all of that into sharp focus for me. So, you know, really want to credit you and the SDA for the um, leadership you sh showed with that. I'm just so thrilled that that's um, been one of the drivers behind this work and Senate, sorry, work and uh, care inquiry from the Senate. It's terrific. Now, I don't know if you wanted to comment on any of that. I know that the Victorian government has been working on a, a, a strategy around um, the care sector um, and it has also done a heap of work around uh, better supporting parents when it comes to early childhood education? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've got the $9 billion investment into um, the um, three and four-year-old uh, free kinder and uh, best start, best life. And uh, that's just a major game changer. Our estimates are that within a few years of that operating, that it will open access to um, more work work hours available to um, young or to women with young children of up to about 15,000 more women being able to work um, more substantial hours having that support in place. So it's not only a game changer for the trajectory of, of our young people being able to um, be on the front foot with their education as they move from um, preschool into, into school, but it's also um, a game changer for uh, working uh, parents mm. as well, which is uh, a really amazing commitment. But I wanted to just say just on on um, the observations around uh, care industry and w one of the things we've done in our school system is to step up a tutor learning initiative program, which has meant we've had to recruit 6,000 um, tutors into our schools over the last few years. And um, overwhelmingly of, of the tutors that I've been able to meet in the last eight months, uh, they are women who have care needs, who had um, walked away from teaching because they couldn't get part-time positions. 
um, this this whole program is delivered in a part time capacity. So everyone that comes into it is is able to work part time if they choose to, and a majority of, the, of them are. But I've heard from so many of the women. I said, oh, you know, why did you why did you walk away from teaching? It was like because I didn't have an option to work part time, and I have to care for my mum, or I have to care for a, a disabled child, or I have little children. Just um, a myriad of issues and uh, overwhelmingly the majority of of people that we've got in those positions of tutor uh, learning are women and they're women with care responsibilities so it just goes to show that there was uh, a dire need out there for us to continue Mm. to be able to engage women on their terms um, and their needs and we had no trouble filling those positions. That's fantastic. Exodus of knowledge that we were prepared to just walk out the door it's amazing isn't it Mm. like all that training and skill um being just not utilized so it's great but many of them kept up their registration as teachers but weren't in the classroom and it's something in you know in in a time where we've got workplace pressures we need to really focus now on how we can offer that flexibility across the system and I think there's a lot of industries that are going to have to look at that yeah We've seen that in childcare. I think a lot of people walking away mm. from childcare because it doesn't offer part-time work, which is kind of ironic. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it is kind of ridiculous. Um, it's a great example, actually, of w- what I hope that we start to see more and more of as we see the Victorian government and the federal government really embrace gender-responsive budgeting. This is a big yep. bugbear of mine, and um, you know, it's only as I've um, really come to understand the importance of budgets. I know this might sound very naive of me, but, you know, there's really no point um, uh, directing your advocacy only at sort of winning the heart if you don't win the mind and the money. Um, And if it doesn't appear in the budget, then the the reality is that your great program and your great advocacy is not going to get funded. Uh, So, you know, what I want to see a whole lot more of is that as we, as policies are developed, that the impact Um, both positive and negative, on everybody is taken into account. Um, You know, Nat, your example is a great example. It's not only of benefit to all of those women, but actually they're all going to be consumers in our economy. They're all going to be taxpayers as well. There's a productivity boost. So there is a, a, you know, a a positive um, case for making sure that we make these positions available and we don't lose these skills. So, you know, seeing all of that stacked up as part of the case around how we address policy questions, I think has the potential to be a, a big game changer. And before we run out of time, can I just plug the fact that we have a gender equity um, strategy and action mm. plan um, that is a new one that will be uh, released this year for, for our state. And um, a big focus of that is um, approaching our policy from an age-based perspective because women's needs change dramatically depending on where they're at at their stage of life. And just jumping back to those women that are that are doing the tutor learning delivery in our schools, they may want to come back to full-time work um, once their care responsibilities are done. By having this opportunity, they're keeping their qualifications, they're keeping their experience up. And I think that's something that costs so many industries is if we're not providing the support and flexibility, um, then we're we're losing the experience of women from various um, really important roles and sectors. Oh, completely. Um, Do we need to spend a minute saying thank you to Jacinda Ardern before we wrap up this podcast? I was very sad to see her go. Um, You know, she was so incredibly impactful and such an inspiration. Uh, And she, you know, she led with such class. Uh, It was um, quite a shock when she announced her resignation. Any reflections from either of you about Jacinda? Mm, It's sad. But I think it came out too after the fact about the level of um, gendered violence she was experiencing so back to that point yeah. we were discussing earlier, but that was a factor and I think that's got to be addressed because um, to lose a leader uh, of, of her skill and uh, empathy and um, just, you know, it's a, real, it's a real shame. But I do think we have to be clear that that was part of um, some of, I think, her decision-making in that. Um, 
and mm. you get to a point where you're just a bit exhausted by it all, unfortunately. And, and this is a woman who, you know, history will, will look back and go, wow, um, she had everything thrown at her as a leader. You know, the yeah. kitchen sink of yeah. issues was thrown Fast. at her and yeah. she handled every single one of them with yeah. absolute kind of dignity and compassion and respect and I think that's um, what she'll you know, go down in history for is uh, her capacity to manage so much challenge from natural disaster to, you know, to the horrific attack that happened in Christchurch. Then mm, just, mm. you know, and then putting New Zealand on the world stage in so many ways. So it's just phenomenal. Yeah. I think it was nice to see um, what you call the soft skills, which are a lot harder than the hard skills, just being um, coming to the fore in such a um, large way and people seeing her uh, behave in the way she did and and lead people through those pretty significant crises that they had in um, New Zealand um, and just a different um, sense of compassion from a leader um, but still strong and and yeah I just thought it's a real shame um, and I think yeah we'll all look back in the years and and just see um, the contribution uh, even more clearly in a few years time about the role that she's had and the impact. Absolutely. I'm sure she hasn't stopped contributing, so looking forward no, to seeing what she does next. So that's a big thank you from uh, the International Women's Day Special Edition, a socially democratic podcast from uh, us, Jacinda. So thank you for everything that you did. Now, as is traditional, I'd like to ask each of you uh, what you'd like to see happen over the next 12 months, how you'd like to see the dial shift on gender equality. Uh, Julia, perhaps if I start with you. Uh, thanks, Luke. I had two probably. I'm keen to see the impact uh, that the changes in law will have and the way that, um, you know, it'll happen in workplaces to reduce the levels of sexual harassment because that is just such mm. a huge issue um, for our members and for a lot of young people. And the other one is just to see the impact the changes to the Act have in terms of um, the ability to uh, ask for flexible work and have a process to work through um, for our members, that is a huge, huge issue. And I think that will be life changing for many, many retail workers and fast food workers that we represent. So I'm really looking forward to the year ahead, actually. Usually I'm a bit more negative, but on this one, I'm, um, <laughs> I think there's some really good changes and it's just, you know, trying to make sure they deliver on the promise and, and making sure um, no unintended consequences, but we get some good decisions and case law out of, um, that, but at the ultimately, regardless of case law, just improving the lives of working women in Australia would be a great outcome for the next 12 months. Fantastic. Right. I could not agree more. And Nat? Uh, I think um, for me, if I can get a gender equality strategy and action plan out of the door um, successfully, that really looks at um, the different different um, phases of life for women and the challenges at each and also intersectional issues, making sure that we are really capturing um, First Nation voices and uh, cold uh, women's experiences mm. and refugee women experiences uh, into that and really just you know, being able to um, make it a positive and accessible document that, that people can pick up and utilise would be um, a bit of a dream to see happen uh, this year, but also I'd love to see um, that uh, that reporting around gender equality um, across all of our states and nationally happening at a better, bigger commitment, better commitment um, from all of those involved, and seeing it um, wash out across the the private sector as well as the public sector. Mm, data is definitely power. And uh, I'm going to add one to the list. I don't normally do this, but I think each of you know that I've been working hard on a legislative ban for non-disclosure agreements in sexual harassment matters. Um, did a podcast with Stephen and uh, an international law professor, Julie McFarlane, a few weeks ago on why we need that. So I won't go into the reasons why here, but I'm hoping that we see that over the course of the next 12 months. Well, as always, it's been an absolute delight talking to the two of you. Um, you make me mad, you make me sad, you make me angry, you make me inspired, you make me passionate. Uh, but, you know, I'm just so uh, proud of the work that you both do and so grateful for the fact that you've worked so hard day in, day out with all the challenges that uh, you face and the, the challenges that your constituents and your members face around the issues of gender inequality. 
uh, but you know, always leave these podcasts feeling optimistic about the fact that we are going to achieve change because you're so determined to see it happen. And thank you, Stephen, once again for handing the podcast over to us. Uh, you know, we always love having this chat, and it's uh, really meaningful and impactful uh, to us that you uh, make the call to hand it over on this very important day. So thank you, and look forward to chatting again in twelve months' time. Thanks, Thanks Liberty. Thank See thank you. you. Thanks, Bye. Julia. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Socially Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And to get all the latest on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday. Socially Democratic was brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Morris Blackburn Lawyers have spent more than a century paving the hard path to justice for everyday Australians. They've helped over 500,000 Australians turn their situation around and they know how the system works. Their experience and skills means you'll get the best results possible. Find out more on their website, morrisblackburn.com.au. Morris Blackburn, experience you can count on. Social Democratic was brought to you by SwiftFox. Every moment on a campaign matters. You need the tools that you can trust, lists that are up to date, phone banks that can change minds, emails that drive donations, events that will energize the community online and offline, and text blasts that distill your message perfectly. SwiftFox CRM is made for campaigners by campaigners. To find out more, go to swiftfoxcrm.com to win your next campaign.